it's a different address, a different person, a different sponsor. And I'd like to tell you the story. I, I, for a number of years, I was fundraiser for First Night. You have a whole bunch of sponsors, and if you lose two or three or four, this year we lost two big ones, uh, you have a large area to draw from, and you need to be, they need to be replaced. This group is a small group, and our pool, our sponsor pool is St. Jen. And if you lose somebody, because such a thing is attrition, and if you lose somebody from this group, it's going to be hard to find another one. And I don't drive, I don't have a car anymore, I don't drive anymore. And this is the kind of fundraising that needs face to face. So the story is that you are the ones who are keeping it going, not me. So when you put your notes in these envelopes and thank them, uh, ask Ken uh, Hammond, who, is he here? Yeah. Oh, there he is, hi. He told me that instead of nailing it in, you dropped by uh, Gochi's and thanked Carol directly. And uh, from this report, she was very enthusiastic about getting these notes. Every day she was getting them. So this, this is a sponsor retention program. It's very important. You are the ones who keep it going, not me. Okay, so don't, don't, uh, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, no. <laughs> so I just want to make the, uh, the uh, announcement that just, and you know who these people are. NBRH is the sponsor of the week. This week, every week is different. Uh, White Market uh, Academy, uh, Community National Bank, the Sunset Savings Bank. Uh, Burke is coming in. They don't have the sign on yet. And uh, who else I forget? Go to Mrs. Kenfield. Yeah. So there you are. But it's very, very important because I'm not doing this. You're the ones who are keeping, keep this program going. We lose our sponsors. We lose the program. Okay, did I make you feel guilty enough? <laughs> Good, nice try. <laughs> well, welcome once again. Um, I just want to tell you that next week the speaker is Rachel Kane, owner of Perennial Pleasures Nursery and Tea Garden in East Hardwick. <clears throat> and um, she specializes in old fashioned flowers and herbs. So she'll be here next week. For a month last summer, Josh Seaman traveled through Israel and Jordan teaching teenagers how to play ultimate frisbee. And unfortunately, he can't teach us that today. <laughs> um, and experiencing the vibrant culture of the Middle East. From days spent in a Palestinian refugee camp to helping create friendships amongst fractured populations in the north coast of Israel, Josh had a front row view to a region of extraordinary international importance. During his presentation, Josh will talk about his explorations and work with ultimate peace, as well as the lessons he learned while living in what he describes as one of the most interesting places on the planet. Josh grew up on a farm in western Massachusetts and graduated from Pomona College in Southern California, where he majored in math and played lots and lots of ultimate frisbee. <laughs> Immediately after graduating, he started teaching math at St. Johnsbury Academy, the job he holds today. Um, in addition to teaching math, he's also the Academy's Director of Academic Technology Integration. Immediately after his arrival at the Academy, he founded a club ultimate frisbee team that has grown into a fully funded varsity program that fields three teams each spring as well as the largest high school ultimate tournament on the East Coast. He served for three years on the board of directors of Ultimate, uh, of USA Ultimate, the national governing body for the support of Ultimate in the United States. He's now US Ultimate's regional youth director for the Northeast, as well as a coaching instructor. He lives in St. Johnsbury with his wife, Kendra Popst, and uh, she's the Academy's Language Department Chair and two Golden Retrievers. <laughs> Josh Seaman. I think you actually, uh, you've come across something. I was in Chicago last weekend actually coaching and uh, one thing that's great about going to Chicago is I can visit my 90-year-old grandparents in their retirement home, which is great to do with 20 high school ultimate players. And we visited them and my grandmother took us over to the other building and took us to the roof. It's this great view from Evanston. You can see down into Chicago and you can see the water. And we went up through, a, we kind of interrupted a large module game. And we walked through and people were very polite and waved to us. And I was out in the windy, 
kind of terrace out with the kids and this 82 uh, year old gentleman came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and I kind of automatically assumed that maybe I had done something wrong. I was like, so do you, do you hold a forehand like this or like, so it was actually, at, it might, I was, you actually do like this and I had the disc and I showed him. So I, I think I have a market that I have. <laughs> it's, it's something I need to work on. I live my life to collect stories. On July 15th of 2012, I was in the West Bank. I was in the lobby of the Paradise Hotel, which is directly across the street from the Aza refugee camp. I was sitting around a table with Lara, a camp CIT from Ultimate Peace. It was about 100 yards away from a 30-foot concrete wall with that actual sign right there is painted on there. Um, and I was there with uh, the two two of the executive directors of Ultimate Peace, uh, one of my traveling partners, and Laura there in the bottom right, and two of her friends. She was uh, hosting us. I, uh, all of us had come from uh, uh, the second day of a Muslim wedding we'd gone to the day before where I learned how to, how to dance uh, in a proper way. And she was, she was pretty upset because her, the principal at her school in Beit Zahor, which is about uh, not very far east of, of Bethlehem, was uh, pretty much uh, threatening to kind of take away the ultimate team at their school, the, the ultimate peace satellite team. Uh, the, 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 the director of the school was very worried about something I learned about called normalization, which is this fear that some of the cross-population uh, activities supported by the Israelis was surely used for photo ops and nothing more. And there's kind of a, it's very complicated when you bring up words like, uh, names like Ariel Sharon, so they saw there's a, they saw ultimate peace, so they associated with uh, the Sharon Project of Peace. And uh, it was a very tense situation. And this girl's 17. She's talking about how it would, you know, she, she did not know what to do. She didn't want to push against this principle because she was worried that the principle would take it away. Um, so, you know, she was trying to figure out what to do. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I think this is towards the end of my 30 days in, uh, in the Middle East. And I understood about, you know, I understood infinitely more at that point than I did at the started my journey and I was still an infinite number of miles away from understanding where she was coming from. But I understood enough to, the only thought I interjected was, oh, Laura, you're 17. You know, let's let Rob and Linda here, the two executive directors who've done a wonderful job reaching out to communities, uh, talk to your principal. Um, later that day I went back across the street, met with some of my ultimate uh, friends in Aza, and then flew back home. But let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to the beginning. There's three, three people that came together in, uh, in Israel. Ava Shine graduated from the academy. She's in the upper left right there uh, in 2012. She played ultimate for me for a number of years. Her, her older sister did as well. And for her senior capstone at St. Johnsbury Academy, she uh, uh, raised money for Ultimate Peace. And she actually came to Ultimate Peace as a CIT the same last summer with me as well. In the middle, that's Hamuda Dajna. He grew up in Bethlehem. I was about 20 meters away from his, his family's house in the West Bank uh, when I was at that Paradise Hotel. Uh, he grew up in the West Bank and as a middle schooler, uh, met a woman traveling through from the Hotchkiss School. Uh, the next year he found himself as a freshman at the Hotchkiss School and finished there playing ultimate. I coached him uh, the, the fall before and that's me in the bottom right as a young man at Pomona College. I grew up on a farm, as you heard, in Western Massachusetts. I've got a congregationalist preacher mom and a bread-baking father. Uh, went west and studied mathematics in the foothills of the mountains outside of uh, Los Angeles, near Mount Baldy. And then when I was looking for a job, I had that moment where you know, it was the end of the tech bubble and many of my friends still were being propelled up to the Bay Area and many were being propelled into teaching uh, in Teach for America or the Peace Corps. Someone said, you know, and I just decided not to take the GRE and not to do math, but I loved it since so you could teach. And I was lucky enough to end up stumbling into the perfect profession for me. I ended up in the Northeast Kingdom, close to my family, and I've been in an environment where I've been free to explore and to play and to follow my passions, which is what led me here. I grew up really close to Amherst. My father's business is in Amherst, so I went to Amherst Regional High School. I grew up in a place that I knew was special and I knew was different, but I didn't fully realize how different it was until I left the area. 
uh, there, were, there were certain things that were different. I mean, I, I, I didn't meet someone who outwardly identified as a Republican until I was 19. Um, I, there, are, there are many things around that. Um, I grew up thinking half the world was Jewish. Uh, uh, Amherst was an interesting place to grow up. I loved it. And one of the things that was great about Amherst was that uh, uh, Ultimate was a very, very popular sport. Uh, a woman came to Amherst Regional High School in 1991 named Tina Booth. If you were to Google this name, she's the equivalent of uh, the most successful high school ultimate coach in the history of the sport, and I was lucky enough to end up at that high school. And I played ultimate for her for two years, and my senior year became a varsity sport. The first national title for high school was held in 1998 in Maplewood, New Jersey. If you look into things, you'll, you'll find a raging debate between several camps of where ultimate was first invented or played. Uh, the real answer, so you can trump people, is the first uh, first time it was taught was at North of Mount Hermon uh, by a man named uh, Joel Koss, um, who uh, learned it or came up with it while he was at Amherst College. So Amherst really is the true birthplace. That's kind of a Yankees Red Sox kind of debate that no one's ever really going to win. But um, while I was there, you know, it was a, just one of the other varsity sports, very serious. But at the same time, ultimate is, you know. 95% of it is exactly what you would see in other sports, but there's a major component that is a little different. Uh, every sport has sportsmanship. Every sport has some form of spirit of the game, some sort of you know, ethical core. In Ultimate, there are no refs. That's what you hear, but it's not actually true. There are actually 14 of them. Everybody on the field makes calls. You are fouled, you make a call, you have a discussion about it. There, there are rules in place about how those discussions take, take place. Um, there's slightly different modifications, uh, but at the core of Ultimate is this idea that you have an active discussion at all times with your opponent. And after high school and after playing in college, which I loved, there's no, at the time there were no divisions in college Ultimate. It meant that I was going to a school of 1,500 people. Uh, Claremont College is at 5,000 total. And we'd go to tournaments where we'd be in a pool with UC Santa Barbara, UCLA, University of Texas, and Claremont. And uh, I, I remember talking with people from the University of Texas, and their freshman class was five times the size of all five of our schools put together. So it was a great experience, really high level. Um, it was a neat situation to walk into because it was a strong program, but they didn't have a long history of having any coaches. So I got to take a, it's really where I learned how to start being an ultimate leader. And then I transitioned to Northern Vermont, where there's this equidistant problem of being in, you know, equidistant from many things, airports, uh, <laughs> competitive ultimate teams. So the kinds of teams that I wanted to play on were not close enough for me to regularly attend practice. I couldn't go to Boston four times a week. It wasn't going to happen. And uh, I remember in that first fall of 2002, it was six months after graduating from college and driving a moving truck to St. Johnsbury, Vermont, uh, getting some kids throwing. And there had been a game of ultimate played at Winter Carnival for years, which was good, but there had been no organized club. And I got some kids throwing that first year. And then that first fall, I, that second fall I had was more organized. And I said, you know, why don't I try applying to go to a tournament? And the tournament that my high school holds in Amherst is the oldest and uh, it's a very competitive tournament. Why not apply and get on the waiting list, you know, just get on the radar? And I actually kind of forgot about it. And then in February of that next year, we got a letter saying, you're in. <laughs> and that was my first kind of big lesson in you, you don't know what you don't know. You know, you, you don't know if something is possible until you try it. And at that point, I said, well, you know, let's see. You don't, you, you don't know if you're not going to get something unless you ask for it. So I just started asking for stuff at the academy. Can I have a bus? Can I have a field? And they looked at it. And again, this was another reason why St. Johnsbury Academy was a great place to work. They said, OK, you have student interest. You can drive the bus. You just need fields. You don't need $10,000 worth of equipment. Let's see what happens. So we played a 30-game season that first season. And three years later, we were a varsity sport. And since then, I've uh, branched out into coaching all-star teams, uh, regional all-star teams. Uh, last year, my girls, the girls St. J team won the girls' state championship. The boys uh, won their second one. Um, the picture you see in the bottom right is uh, a team I work with. I, I coach the Boston Ultimate Disc Alliance's national, national team for the co-ed division that I've been coaching at since 2005. And it was the kind of world where there was always something more to do. So I served on the board of directors and got to work on national policy work. But what I've been doing for 10 years has been coach ultimate inside the world of ultimate. That's, that's really what my focus has been. And it's given me a, a great perspective because the idea of an ultimate coach is not old. Uh, the ult ultimate itself was first played in 1968, so the sport is very new. And coaching ultimate is, is quite new. And when you go out into a community and you say, I mean, if I ask this room, who could, 
who could coach, who's played basketball? Who knows enough about basketball to maybe coach basketball or, or baseball or you know, you know, any, any sport that's been around for 100 plus years? You'll find somebody that can do that. We're just now getting kids who are second generation ultimate players. That's how new the sport is. And I've been lucky enough to coach some of those kids and they are fantastic. Um, but it meant that my primary job of being an ultimate coach meant that there were many avenues for me to apply that knowledge. Um, there's, a, there's a need for coaches. Many people tend to want to do more inside the world of ultimate, so they play all the time. And there are player coaches, but my perspective was coaching. So I love coaching. I've done coaching instruction, and that led me to Ultimate Peace. Ultimate Peace was founded in 2009. Uh, there was a group of uh, many American players, but then international players that wanted to run a clinic. So they ran a five days of clinics in Tel Aviv, and it was not residential in 2009. And then in 2010, 11, and 12, the camp, the camp became residential in 2010 and stayed residential. Uh, it's, it's a simple mission to build bridges of friendship, understanding, and fun for youth from different social and cultural backgrounds from around the world, the tool ultimate. And you know, one thing I've learned about organizations is that many, you know, almost all organizations have a mission. They have values. They have st things that they state they are. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to me how those organizations live their mission. Uh, do their members know what the mission is? How do they practice what they say they do? Um, but what was, you know, first drew me to Ultimate Peace was it was something I loved. It was ultimate uh, being applied to a, uh, a place and a people uh, that it theoretically could have a great impact. Structurally, they, you know, the belief is that the way you play the game and the way you live are deeply intertwined. Uh, there's a the specific ethic of uh, spirit of the game and talking to your opponent as a core element to the sport was I think probably what first led to the idea of using ultimate in particular as a relationship building sport. Uh, there are other sports programs like Ultimate Peace um, where they use sport to bring populations together but there's this added element that there isn't a, th a third party in the middle. You are directly face to face. And then also, then the, you know, transitioning into the dream, you wanted to see, want to see these relationships you know, change, really just change the world. And you know, that, it, it seems like a, a big goal, but I truly believe it can happen. Structurally, it's a nonprofit, and it centers around these five beliefs: friendship, mutual respect, integrity, nonviolence, and fun. And the, the efficacy of a mission, I think, part of it can be, you know, do you see those things in daily life? Uh, are they, are you, do you come back to them? And you know, what you see right there is that's me in the second week of camp. I'm in the bottom left right there. Um, I'm with the beginning girls team that I coached that week. I had 12 campers from uh, uh, Israel and the West Bank. I had three different assistant coaches from three different countries and three different counselors in training from three different countries. And we just gotten out of the uh, foam pit. Um, it was an interesting experience to say the least, but uh, uh, you'll see, I think Ava, Ava's buried there somewhere. You'd have to look, it's kind of hard to see her, but she's there in that, on that team. When they first started that clinic in 2009, I don't think there was a, a, a concrete vision for we're gonna do this and then this and then this. They had very, very, very uh, uh, experienced people at the helm that really know how to get things done. I had met the founder, one of the founders, David Barkin, years before when I was on the board and he helped USA Ultimate come up with a mission and do some strategic planning. So he really, you know, he was a, a great person to, to believe in and I certainly believe in everything that he's worked with. But they have branched out into creating community team practices. So what they do is they, the first kids that came to Ultimate Peace, they went back and they said, okay, we would really like a team to start in your community. So now there are community teams in I think 12 or 13 different cities and villages and towns in Israel and the West Bank. Um, they ran, started running tournaments to bring these teams together. Uh, they created a youth league. The overnight summer camp is what I participated in. And then they also created a counselors and training program. And as, as, the program, all, as these programs have built, have grown, they have built very well and efficiently into each other. The communities growing during the year have fed more campers to come to the camp. The counselors and training program now runs year round. And as there have been more players and there's been more demand, the villages themselves have said, okay, we really want to support this and bring, pe bring local people into the mix, um, which has led to having enough people on the ground in Israel to run year-round programs, which means that instead of it just being one clinic or one overnight camp, it's a, it's a permanent rotation of you know, everything kind of cycling into 
each other. Geographically, this is where everybody was coming in from. Um, you've got the green, which is the West Bank. You've got the Golan Heights up in to the, the yellow region to the right. And then the, the, the colored circles are the 12 communities. Um, I saw some of them. I went into Beit Zahor, uh, uh, which is in the blue. Uh, I don't think I labeled the blue actually up there. But over in the green region, the blue, over to the, 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 the easternmost blue is one of the re, uh, towns that I went to. And then I also went to... Uh, Boina Nujadat, which is in the orange up near the Golan Heights. Uh, we did community visits after the program was over. You came and met the kids and met some of their local family members. Um, the southernmost city down there, uh, said Bakor, uh, it's down in the Negev Desert. Uh, it is a dry, dry place. Now, 12 communities. Uh, the goal is to you know, keep on adding communities. And really, at this point, the only thing holding the growth back is, well, there's two big things. One is it's always money. There's, there's, there's always something that can be spent on, and there's a way to spend it here. Uh, the other thing is uh, d approaching communities in the right way. You can't just go into a community. There are numerous reasons why you can't just go into a community in Israel or the West Bank and say, I'd like to do this. Give me your children. You know, it's not, it's, there, there, it, there's a nuance to doing that anywhere, but there's a nuance to very specific to the region. Um, you know, the, I, Add, adding at least one community every year. And there are a waiting list of communities at this point. There are places that would like to join the program that they just don't have enough people to wor work with them yet. There were 210 campers last summer. Every summer they're adding, it's growing about 40 or 50 campers. Um, uh, the, the physical space where the overnight camp was held, the residential camp was held, was a, a residential school that was out for the summer. So we could take over the entire campus, which is, which is great. Um, field space is an eternal struggle for me here in the Northeast Kingdom where nothing is flat. And it's an eternal struggle there too. Finding flat, grassy areas is very challenging. So that's another constriction. Uh, there were 40 CITs and 50 coaches. So there's a great ratio of people, non-campers, you know, adults and instructors to campers. Um, you know, usually you see like one to 10 or one to eight. It was really almost like one or two, you know, one or two to 10 or three to 10, which was a wonderful uh, uh, ratio. The six administrators uh, were worked to the extreme, and you had people who were um, the the local coordinators who took care of logistics. Uh, then there was a second logistics coordinator who's an Arab Israeli who was able to travel into the West Bank, um, who did a lot of the visa work. And if you ever want to complain about paperwork again, I have some people you should talk to, and you'll feel better about the paperwork you have to do. <laughs> Um, right now, the breakdown, there's three general populations that come to camp, uh, Arab Israelis, Jewish Israelis, and people from the Palestinians from the West Bank. It's about 40, 40, 20 right now. Uh, one of the populations that's actually the hardest to bring in is actually the local uh, Jewish Israelis um, for various reasons. But the, the idea, the optimal is an equal mix of each. You really have to have an equal percentage. So it's, it's, it's a challenge at times. But uh, the, the West Bank communities are sending more kids in. And uh, the communities inside both the Arab and the Jewish communities inside Israel um, are sent. It's, it's growing. So I, I see it as you know it's a constant thing to watch out for. But I think they're going to get closer to 30, 30, 30. Uh, it's now two weeks. So it's two week-long sessions. Uh, it grew into a residential camp in 2010. And then they added a couple days and made it longer. And then they split it into two weeks this last summer, where the first week was only returning campers and more advanced players, and then new players and beginner players the second week. Um, and then there were many kids that came to both. There was a big overlap between the sessions. Um, I, you know, it'll, it's, it's running as two weeks, two five-day sessions this coming summer. Um, there might be a different location for more fields, but it's, it's, it's growing quickly. And the entire budget for last year was $310,000. Uh, the organization is uh, going after grants and funding all, all over the place. Again, it's the primary, you know, whatever money can appear can be used. There, there's, there's definitely a need. So great way to see what Ultima Peace is, is to see this. <laughs>
So what you just saw there was something that happened pretty much every day. You just saw a video made by a, a Protestant American of a secular Israeli Jew and an American Jew singing about peace in northern Israel to a population that it was made up of people, of kids who would never have normally met ever in their entire life. And that was just normal. Um, one of the things that struck me about camp, you know, people would ask me, what, what was it like? And there are many topics I'm going to cover today that I could talk for days upon. But one of the great things about the camp was that it was just camp. You know, you, you, the, the, that's what was special about it, that it was this, this sense of many of the things that you grew up, and I'm sure many of you went to summer camp, there were many parallels, I'd imagine, between what your experience was like, and, that, and that's what they believe in. And you'll notice that, you know, all of those things that, the, you know, you saw the mutual respect, friendship, nonviolence, fun, it's, it's right there. The kid, you know, you could ask any kid on the spot, you know, what's this camp about, and they'll know it. You can't live something unless you know it. So where did I go? Here's the geography of where I was. It's a pretty exciting place. Um, I flew in to Tel Aviv uh, and ended up going to all of those different blue dots you see. Uh, a couple of them down in the south are in Jordan, but everything else is in Israel. Uh, the one other place I would have technical access to would be Egypt. There is a nice treaty that gets Israelis in there as well. Um, at the time, it was not the best place to go, and it still isn't the best place to go as an American, but Jordan was great, and we're going to talk about that later. But you got Lebanon to the north. Uh, there's the border with Syria. While I was there, the civil war was ramping up, um, so it was, it was busier. You heard about it all the time. Uh, but that's the, the, the geography. It's right in the heart of everything, right in the heart. Was there for 33 days. Uh, the communities you're looking at, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Bethlehem in the West Bank, Jericho in the West Bank, Beit Zahor, Akko up in the north coast. It's next to Haifa. Uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful city. Um, you've got Ilat, which is down on the southern tip there on the Red Sea, right where Jordan, Egypt, and Israel all meet. You can see very clearly all three spaces. Boina Nujadat, which is up in the northeast next to the Golan Heights. Uh, Aqaba, and then Wadi Rum and Petra are in Jordan. Wadi Rum is in the desert down in the south of Jordan, and Petra is up towards the north. It's kind of being blocked out by that blue dot. Israel itself, it's really, really, really small. Israel is the size of New Jersey. Uh, you have an you know, overall land mass of just over 10 million square miles for Israel and the West Bank together. You have an overall population of 7.2 million with 3 million in the West Bank. And you have this classification of non-Israeli Palestinians and then 430,000 and quickly growing Israeli citizens in the West Bank. The United States is 3 million square miles. It's a small, small place. It always kind of struck me. I think the first lesson I got was when I was in northern Israel at the camp and I needed to get down to Jerusalem. And traveling on uh, Shabbat is challenging because all the public transport shuts down. What I learned is that there's a very, very, very active rental car business in Israel. So I rented a car and drove down, and my Israeli friends were saying, wow, that is, don't you need a cooler full of food and all, you know, what, where are you, all your supplies? And I was like, it's, it's like three hours. It's not that long. And what I found is that there's like a five times multiplier where a three-hour drive in Israel is the equivalent of a 15-hour drive in the United States. That's what I found out. But it was great. And I got to tell you, driving on Shabbat in Jerusalem was wonderful. Here are five stories from my travels last summer. My introduction to Israel came in London. Uh, I flew on El Al, and I flew into London. The first leg was on Delta, and it was some code share. And um, uh, it's early in the morning, and I'm going pretty quickly through Heathrow, which is a sprawling place. And I get to the El Al's desk, at the, not the desk, but the, the actual gate because I'd already cleared security in the United States. But there's clearing security, and then there's clearing El Al security. It's totally different, and not just in thematics, but you have to clear both. So I'm in line, and something said in Hebrew, and I don't understand it. And it's my first of many instances where I had to ask for help. And they said, OK, there's this line if you've cleared. And of course, I got in the wrong line. I get sent back, and I get into the right line. And what I see happening is what I had, uh, assumed was going to happen was the interview of you know, why are you going, what are you doing, you know, many different. I'd heard about what was going to happen. And it was interesting because you had these pretty, what seemed to be, you know, from an American perspective, personal conversations. It was right there. I mean, I'm in line and I kind of heard the standard questions and I'm logicking out what different forks they can take at certain points. And I get up and it's my turn and, uh, you know, where are you going? What are you doing? And, you know, silly me and I like to talk anyway. I'm just saying everything, right? <laughs> you know, and I'm going and I'm working with Ultimate Peace and I'm going to go to Bethlehem and Jericho and Beit Zahor and Akko and, 
these are not, you know, standard places to go. Very, you know, there's, you know, I'm just being totally open and I used to ask me all these, who are you visiting, where are you going? And, you know, I, I remember numbers. I'm a math person, so I remember all these addresses and things. And, you know, I realized kind of halfway through, I'm like, I must seem really weird. And he goes, okay, that's nice. Um, be right back. And he comes back with somebody else about five minutes later <laughs> who proceeds to ask me the same questions with him standing next to me. You know, is there consistency? And I, it was fine. It went through, it took about almost a half an hour. But by that time, almost everybody had gone through security and there's a holding area. So I'm the last one through and I have my one, ca one carry on. And I was, one of the jobs I was gonna do in, in addition to helping train coaches at Ultimate Peace, I was gonna blog about it extensively. I'm an extensive sharer. And I wasn't sure what I was gonna need. So the way I prepare for what I don't know about is just to prepare for just about anything. So I had tons of stuff in my check baggage, but I had my carry on, which was all the electronics I thought I even might need at some point. So I had a carry-on that was essentially all plastic bags full of electronics. So they put it through and they're like, they pull it out, they're like, hey, sit here. So I sit down and the guy opens it up and I see him visually go, <sighs> and it took about 40 minutes. Every single thing had to be swabbed, you know, put through the you know, vapor, every single thing. And I'm, he's like, what, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a blogger. He's like, Tumblr. I'm like, yes, that is, sure, that's what I do. Um, going back and forth. I mean, I'm worried. I'm visually, I'm very worried about missing the, the plane. He's like, don't worry. It's not going anywhere. We know you're here. And it was fine. I got it all packed up and got on the plane. But that was my first lesson. And what I was told later was, I was told many different ways, but the best way that I remember it is the, is, is the Israeli people are like prickly desert cactus. And that's the translation. There's a, there's a word for this specific type of cactus where it's, you know, kind of thorny on the outside, but very sweet on the inside. And that's what I saw time and again. And it was very interesting. I found out that my first experience was with El Al. But uh, it, it certainly introduced me uh, quite quickly to what it was going to be like in many different circumstances while I was traveling. <laughs> I mentioned it before, but camp was like, in, it was like camp. Uh, I was asked several times by counselors and by other people, you know, wh wh what was so different? And there were many, the, the, the impact was different, but itself, camp was, you'd get up in the morning, we would play ultimate, we would have meal together, we'd go to the pool together, we'd play some more ultimate, we'd have an organized game against one of the other teams. The first week I worked, uh, the first week was the returning campers, and I had a boys team uh, from uh, 11, 11, 11 or 12 boys, and there was a pretty good breakdown of I had kind of like four, three, and I think four for Jewish, Jewish Israelis, Arab Israelis, and kids from the West Bank. And it was skill based. You know, there was there was you know there was tension between the teammates for teenager reasons. And you know, some people found it kind of strange that that's what I would focus on, but that's what was so again what I said before so great about it. Um, we would have uh, a talent show. Uh, the kids would get up and do the most, uh, you know, the amazing things from their communities, and then go and spend the night together in their in their dorms, having conversations about life that they never would have normally had. Quite literally, one of the first things I learned uh, uh, was truly how segregated the entire region is. It's not just a West Bank, Golan Heights, Gaza, Israel type of segregation. Um, Ali was a player on my team that first week. Um, the Brown team, it's my team getting thrown around right there. Um, and I found out that Ali went to this great, amazing school only about 45 minutes away, more science oriented. And I found out one of the other players on my team was in northern Tel Aviv, not that far away at another good school. And then I, I don't remember what, how the conversation was going, but I mentioned to Ali, he's like, so do you, do you ever see Jonathan here? Jonathan, he's like, no. I'm like, don't you, don't you go to class? He's like, no, we're not the same school. I was like, I was like wait a minute, how many, how many Jewish students are at your school? None. And I turned to Jonathan, I'm like, how many Arab students are at your school? None. And this is not, this isn't like small, like in two, three, four, five percent. When they say zero, they mean zero. So then I, I would play a, an exercise, uh, you know, an investigative exercise when I talk to parents and kids, I would ask things like, you know, you know, is, is you know, you can, li you could live, you could, could, Jonathan, could you go to all these schools? Well, I guess theoretically, I'd have to live there. Well, could you live there? Well, I guess technically. You know, so there's this interesting, complete divide in terms of experience. And some of the best stories came out of the kids where after camp they would actually stop in those communities. They would actually go spend time with their friend 30 minutes away or less that they would have, it could have, it could have effectively been here and a small, tiny Pacific Island nation that you're never going to get to. But just physically getting them together to talk to each other, you know, it, it, you start that conversation, it leads to so much more.
ultimate peace, <laughs> ultimate peace to me is the, the, the perfect mix of many things I like in my life and I love in my life. I love ultimate. I love teaching it to new people. I love new places. And I, I believe that ultimate can do lots and lots of good things. And for me, I believe you have to you have to meet people in order to know them and to understand them. <laughs> so I'm here to help teach, but mainly for me to learn from all of you. Thank you for listening to me, and it's my honor to be here. Anybody else want to say anything? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, so let's stand up now then. Let's stand up. So what you saw there um, first was the children from Bethlehem arriving at camp. Uh, it was a pretty big deal. Up until that point, we'd only had one kid from Bethlehem, Hamuda, who you saw flying through the air at the beginning of camp uh, of the presentation. And what's really interesting about them coming, besides the fact that it's just a challenge to bring children in from the that area, was that you know you could file all the paperwork, you could get everything set, and it, it all comes down to that day: does the bus get allowed across? So we, I'd ask, so do you know? Did you do? The, we did all the paperwork. Sure. Are they coming? Well, we think so. And it was never definite until the kids got there. So the kids got there, we had eight more kids. Second thing you saw there was some of the, uh, some of the drilling, some of the playing going on with, with the coaches at Ultimate Peace. One of the additionally surreal parts and aspects of the camp was that the coaches are the top players in the world. It's the equivalent of Kobe Bryant and LeBron James going into a, it lit, there's no, it's not like if this is the, the actual equivalent playing. And, for me, it was this surreal experience. My experience came from a coaching perspective. I've coached high schoolers and some adults, but you know, fundamentally teaching is coaching. Coaching is teaching. There's certain things you have to do to help people understand how to teach. That's one thing I had done in the United States. That's what I did when I got there. But instead of you know, a, a population of new coaches or pretty experienced coaches, I had some of the most elite ultimate players in the world learning how to coach, which was something I could help them with, but at the same time I wanted to do things like, can I have your autograph, please? <laughs> like I'm not, they, it, was, it was wonderful. So you saw some of them out there working on a patient zone offense. And then the last thing you saw was me talking to the girls team from the second week that I had, where we were uh, going around saying things about what ultimate peace means to us. But one aspect you might have seen was everything I said was being translated into Arabic. And that's actually one of the even more simple situations because in many circumstances, uh, like in the assemblies, everything had to be translated into Arabic and Hebrew. Uh, for the most part, uh, English was the lingua franca, you know, the common language, but there were some people that spoke primarily Arabic and very little Hebrew, or primarily Hebrew and very little Arabic, uh, and there were some English as crossover. But in any situation, there was always at least one translation, and frequently there were two. I started my journey in Tel Aviv, and that's the coast down at the bottom. It looks a lot like Nice. Looks a lot like the French Riviera. It's in the Mediterranean. It's a it's a bit hotter and drier, but it's a, a similar coast. It's a little bit longer, and there's a lot more sand there than there is in Nice. I'll tell you that much. Um, started there with a week of just getting lost in the city. What you see in the upper left is a dome on the rock with two of my traveling companions. You'll see that my shorts are just barely long enough to get me in there without having to buy what my friend is wearing. And what you see in the center uh, is the Wailing Wall. And the upper right is the Church of the Nativity. So we did this great uh, uh, day in Jerusalem where we got lost in the, the warren of streets that don't go in any particular direction. Uh, I've heard because they don't want to make a cross, so they don't. Um, uh, Church of the Nativity, you know, jam full of pe packed full of people, took us forever to find. Um, but it was uh, uh, 
night and day. You go from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem on a public bus takes a, you know, an hour, and it's like going to a different country. You have a, you know, this kind of cosmopolitan city with a loud nightlife, and it's everything you'd think a coastal Mediterranean city would be, and it is. There are certain visual differences um, that I'll get to later, but then you go to Jerusalem, which has a very different feel. You, you read guidebooks about the, uh, the, the kind of the, the aura of being there, and it, it, from my experience, it really is true. It was very, it was a, it was a different place. Uh, time moved kind of differently, and the, it's, it's an, inch, it's, it's a, it's a grand feeling to be at the, the middle of a place that so many people find to be the apex of importance, and kind of everything comes from there. So this is a view from southern uh, Tel Aviv out over the water from a region called Yaffa. This is the Shuk in Tel Aviv. This is where when I got homesick I found the French cheese market. And this is Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, find the Austrian hospice building. You can walk into it, you go to the roof, and this is what you see. And this is the Western Wall. Very, very, very small entrance to get into the dome and the dome itself. <laughs> That's windy. It wasn't incredibly windy, but uh, I didn't have a cover. This is the Church of the Nativity, in Crusaders Chapel. So, you know, like getting back to that phrase, you don't know what you don't know, you really don't know anything. That was the, every time I turned around, there was something massively important happening that it felt like I was completely ignorant of. Uh, this is where the, you know, where the Jesus' tomb, this is where the, 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 cr uh, the cross that performed the miracles but disappeared because the pilgrims ate pieces of it every time they came. Um, there was always something more to learn, always. After the 33, after the 28 days in Israel, I met up with my college roommate in Tel Aviv and we took a Eged bus, the bus system in Israel, down to Ilat, the southern city. Got in at about 10 o'clock at night and it was close to 100 degrees, even at 10 o'clock at night. It's interesting getting off a bus and having it be dark and just having it be an oven. It's like your, your mind really isn't used to it until you've been there. A lot is a, it's a, it's a Vegas city. You know, they've got the, the, art of, the pyramid, IMAX, they've got everything else. You know, the, the Red Sea is right there. You see Jordan, you see uh, uh, Egypt. It was, I liked it because it was a great, you know, compare, you know, it was a great <laughs> difference again from, what, from where I had been. So, and we're only there for the night because the next morning we got up at five and took a cab to the, one of the three crossings into Jordan from Israel. There's one in the south, there's one in the north, and then there is one in the West Bank. And we got there right when it opened. Uh, it's this big space. Uh, the first people through were coming in from Jordan. Uh, and we went through, get checked by the Israelis, go through the buffer area, get checked by the Jordanians. And our goal was to get to uh, Wadi Rum, which is the desert northeast of Elat. Uh, we got a cab, uh, were prepared to haggle over the price and did okay. Um, and we took a cab through uh, the desert region which we had come in through the night in the Negev on the bus, but it was you know, bright, sunny afternoon and it's, it's, it's a moonscape. I mean, it's like, going, it's like going through parts of Arizona, but in a, the rocks are different. The, the, the time, you know, the, the, there's less of a marking of, of place um, when we were driving through the desert into the Wadi Rum. 
And it was one of those experiences of life where you, you go out and you are losing some of that control of, you're going to have to be at this place at this time. But we knew where we had to be and the name of a guy who was meeting us at the entrance to the Wadi Rum. So we got there and it's, we found the entrance and the taxi left and there's nothing. You know, like nothing. We're like, okay. And you know, we, we knew we were in the right place. So we're about 90% sure. But, you know, I had my, kind of had my international cell phone. And, okay, we're going to do this. Another taxi came up. We talked to, we said, can you help us find this person? He's like, oh, I know that person. He called him up. And we got our guide. Drove us into the Wadi Rum. It's a, it's a region. Uh, it's a, a, a system of valleys. And uh, only the, the Bedouins are allowed to be in this space. So there was a small, small village. And the, our guide... You know, he stopped at a small shop, bought food for the day, brought us to his house. We had very, very sweet mint tea, which I love. And then we got into the Jeep and we drove out into the Wadi Rum. And there wasn't like a gate or some sort of, you are now at the Grand Canyon. It was, the town just ended and the sand began. You just drove straight out. And we had a Jeep tour uh, uh, and had lunch and then a three-hour uh, nap in the middle of the day when it was closing in on, you know, 115, you know, 110, 115 degrees. Um, and then we spent the night at the, what you see in the bottom area, uh, uh, the, in the tent areas right there in the bottom. And the thing that was most striking about this area was, in, in addition to just being stunningly beautiful, there's no sound. And it's the equivalent, if you've ever been in total darkness, I've never been anywhere else like it, and at the same time, you can see forever. So you're in this space, and there's a little video clip after this, you'll get a kind of a sense of it, where you can see off to the sunset and the gorgeous mountains and these unbelievable rock faces, and there's not, not a sound. No wind, no birds, no leaves tumbling. There's, all, there's an ambient sound that seems to be present everywhere. And I went to school in Los Angeles, you know, the power's always on. There's always a humming. Nothing, nothing. After Wadi Rum, we took another cab up to Petra, uh, made very famous by the Indiana Jones movies as the final resting place of the uh, Holy Grail. And that's what you see the treasury right there in the middle. Uh, Petra is a stone carved city that was inhabited for a very long time and has not been inhabited for a very long time. Uh, but there's a city, Petra exists, uh, there's a city right there that acts as the entry point for all the many millions of tourists that go. But you can walk through miles of these canyons and there are these carving after carving in the faces of the walls. Um, and then that is my friend that I traveled with in the upper right. But I want to show you a little bit of what it looked like. So this is Wadi Rum. And this is Petra. It's the treasury. You have to realize there's, there's no huge structure in there. You know, the movie, he walks in and he goes in and there's the swinging blades and things. Oh, that's not there. Um, you have about 20, 25 feet at the most, some bigger areas. We have, it's still enormous considering it's going straight into the rock. Uh, the atmosphere there, you know, it is uh, pretty international and tourist. Uh, 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 so there's, you know, it's pretty, pretty crowded, but it's kind of tempered by the fact that it's 110. I mean, it's really, you, you accept it. One thing that's neat about the, I felt it was a good coping mechanism that I think could be adopted in the Northeast Kingdom was there's very little fixation on what actual temperature it is. You know, we have thermometers everywhere telling us it's minus 10 or minus 20 or minus 30. It's cold. It's just hot. It's hot. You hydrate, it's hot. You know, there's no need. When we left, it was closing in on about 117. At that point, too, wind no longer cools you down. Upper left is Hamuda. Hamoud is that uh, player that you saw right at the beginning. He grew up in the West Bank and uh, came to the Hotchka School, knew almost no English at the point when he came in there, and then graduated uh, last year. He's now going to college in the United States. Uh, when I first came in to Tel Aviv for a week before camp started, uh, I had a chance to go on to Beit Sahor into the West Bank and uh, help run a clinic there on actually the first day. So I got in, got in a car, drove to Jerusalem, changed cars, drove into the West Bank, into Bethlehem, then drove into Beit Sohar. It was a long, interesting day. And uh, on the way back out, uh, uh, I, Hamuda came to the first clinic. And then I was going back in. And instead of having to come all the way back out, I ended up spending the night with his, him and his family in the bottom left, his mother, Soad, uh, and his father, who uh, uh, 
runs the, I, some of the IT infrastructure for the city. But I stayed in with them in the Aza refugee camp, which at this point you can, it's, it's, it's hard to get a sense of what it's like because when you think of the words refugee camp, you have a pretty set image that isn't really what it's like. It's a multi-generational refugee camp that's been there for multiple generations. So you have to think of it as a very densely packed apartment complex in a way. Um, and Aza is, there's three, uh, three refugee camps in Bethlehem and the Aza is the smallest. So I stayed with them. They had a very nice, pretty nice place, uh, multiple stories. Um, but I got to speak, you know, I would sit there and speak with the father about what it was like to, you know, run IT infrastructure in Bethlehem for the past almost 30 years. Uh, and his wife was asking me all these great questions about home life. But he spoke pretty good English. Uh, so while the wife didn't speak much, so it was what I had been accustomed to, which is multiple person direct conversations. Um, and then what you see, who you see over on the right is Hamuda's older brother. And he, he was the one who got married the day before when I was first uh, in that, uh, when I told you at the beginning, when I was in the Paradise Hotel. So uh, uh, he, he'd invited some of us to his, his wedding. So Hamuda's story is, is pretty interesting. And I thought having him tell you about it was the best way. How your loved one, the people most important, view your, uh, you know, interaction with Ultimate Peace, how, how they view you working with Ultimate Peace, and maybe, you know, I don't know, I wonder how you, you have any time with your parents, or I don't know if you're going to go any further than what you did, yeah. for the rest of you, as well, mm -hmm. if you're interested. Well, my family, I'm just going to talk about my family, my, my family itself, I have an uncle who's against it, mm -hmm. and I have other uncles who are with it, and my dad and my mom are under the My brother was against it before knowing about it. He just, because my brother was in jail, as I said, he, when I told him I'm going to an ultimate, it's an ultimate camp, and the Israelis was like, I'm 100% against it. Like, I'm 100% against it. And now, after knowing what we do in the camp, that we don't bring politics at all. We don't do anything about politics, we don't have to do anything about politics, only we just play ultimate, which I love, and he actually, Started to love it, and then he he was the one that actually talked to my little brother to join, and then my little brother joined the his joining the team. So like in a way, there is like like it's just like a thing like we but there is like a community that I live in is a small bubble. If you but if you add something different to it, they're not gonna accept it right away. It just needs time. And that's what happened. The first year, as I said, everybody was against it. I still did it. And then after uh, after doing it, more people and more people started accepting it and wanting to do it as well. And with time, I think it's going to grow more and more. So. I first met Hamuda because he played on a regional boys club team that I coach. And I first met him at the tournament. It's this one weekend a year type of thing. And uh, what I learned that weekend was that he was from the West Bank, and that leads to more questions. And what I found out was that he was, uh, you know, that's where I learned that he had come to Hotchkiss um, with another boy, and that his coach a couple years before had said, you know, you should try. I think you really would be, a, you would be a valuable member of this Ultimate Peace Program. He's like, absolutely not. Um, there are a lot of reasons why, you know, I'm not, there's a massive distrust of his, uh, the, his family uh, towards Israel. And I don't know if you caught one of the middle things he said there was, you know, so I heard about that and then his coach said, okay, how about you, he asked him again the next year, said you should try this. And he really trusted his coach and he said, okay, I'll do it. And that's why he did it and then this was, he came back the second year. So he went and he was that, you know, that stone he referred, he came back to his, his community and then that video saw the little kid coming in through the, the pyramid of people, that was the eight other kids from Bethlehem. Uh, I think Hamuda has 60 cousins and not just, I think he has 60 cousins, um, uh, very large families and eight of his friends came and now more and more want to, friends and family want to come. And the middle part there, which is kind of important, is that something I didn't know until I uh, showed up at his family's house, so I'm sitting there uh, one after the second afternoon, speaking to his in his older brother's room. His older brother is 22 at the time last summer, and was you know just checking in on Facebook and doing all these different things, playing with his speakers. You know, it's a pretty standard thing. And then he says, "Hey, do you want to? You know, he speaks pretty good English. You want to see pictures of my time in prison?" And I'm like, "Oh, what? I think I understand. What do you mean?" And that's when I found out about. I don't know if you caught. His brother was in an Israeli jail when his coach at Hoshkis was saying, you should, you should try this. Um, his older brother spent three years 
in an Israeli jail from, 19, from, eight, from age 18 to 21. Uh, you know, it's, it was not, uh, it was something he f freely talked about and showed me, you know, video and photos that he had taken while he was there with many other people his age. And, you know, I asked a few questions, mainly just listening. And, you know, I, and then I asked Hamuda the same question. I was like, so what, like, why, why was your brother in prison? Like, what, what happened? And, you know, I was, you know, I was trying to ask it in such a way that I would get the, the truth. You know, there's different ways to say certain things. And what I got from Hamuda was, no, no particular one reason, um, you know, when you, when Israeli soldiers would in, you know, talk to local youth in the area, his brother was known as kind of a troublemaker. And there might be more behind it. I mean, he was uh, shot at one point, and uh, that was not the incident that led to him being in jail. But he got out. His brother was at this ultimate peace program while he was in jail, came out, and uh, six months later got married and was very talkative. And just like every other early 20-something I had met. There's lots more to that story that, I, that I'm sure I will learn and hope I will learn. Um, and you know, the, the, the fact that I was sitting there in a place that was so, at the same time, similar and strictly different than what I had grown up with and what I had expected was, was truly amazing. So that led me to where I am now. You gotta go. <laughs> There, there, I, there, there are so many different reasons to go to the Middle East, to go to Israel, to go to Jerusalem, to see as much of uh, every other country you can get into as possible. Uh, there, there's something to be said, and I can't stress this enough, that there's something to be said about being in a place. You can read as much as you can. I'm compulsively reading the news and keeping abreast of what's going on in many different sources, and I love information and what's going on over there. You gotta see it and feel it and be there and talk to people. Uh, that there, there is no replacement for that. And in addition, y everybody has a reason to see this area. There's, there's something that directly impacts you from the Middle East or something that you would find interesting. It doesn't have to be religion or politics or geography. Uh, there's so many different things. I mean, I learned about uh, go to Haifa and see the north coast of Israel. Uh, you know, go to Petra if you want to go study archaeology. There's so many different things that the region has to offer. Teenagers or teenagers, uh, you, 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 I, I'm continually uh, kind of re-surprised that it doesn't matter where you go, especially with how you know, flat the world has become, the, the types of issues that the kids had at camp were types of issues they have at St. Johnsbury Academy. Um, the, they were checking in online, they were sending pictures and texting all the, you know, there, there's certain things, you know, uh, it turns out if I go back into the West Bank, uh, the best thing I can wear is jeans. That's a great way to blend in, is to wear jeans. Um, but teenagers are teenagers. It's, as, it's as really as simple as that. Didn't matter where I went. I know absolutely nothing. I worked really, really hard to read books and you know, read Friedman and read historical accounts and know this and know nothing. There's always more. It's, it's, it's certainly one of those situations that you just open one door and find an entire city worth of libraries of what you should know. There, you know, you hear about how there's an infinite complexity to the region and what you could know, and it's, from my experience, absolutely true. There was always something, you know, every conversation I had um, was uh, uh, fascinating for a different reason. I would love to be able to get to the point where I could pretend to be an expert on the Middle East. I don't think anybody is an expert on the Middle East. Anyone can change their mind. Uh, Hamuda's family is this perfect example of every possible reason. The, you know, people have devoted their lives to studying uh, uh, how to make peace in the Middle East, how to bring populations together. Uh, people have spent their lives trying to do that. And I think one of the biggest things you can learn about that, that kind of, the, the, the entire pro process is that it, it's not black and white. There's, there's, no, there's no right and wrong. There are two populations, three populations, four, a hundred populations that have different reasons to like each other, to not like each other, different reasons why they're exactly the same but said to be on different sides. Um, if Hamuda's family can change their mind, 
any, anybody can. People have good reasons on both sides, and it's such a simplistic way to put it. And I hate saying it that way, but at a certain, at a certain point, you just have to say it. There's lots of different uh, words that get parsed. I mean, every time Hillary Clinton speaks about Israel or Barack Obama or Netanyahu says something, everybody's sitting there with a magnifying glass, like, what does that mean? You know, you can't say that, you know, and I, underst I understand the sensitivity, but at a certain point you have to communicate, and you do that by being present and never believing that's not true. Last thing I learned is really, truly nothing is impossible, and that's related to the, you know, anybody can change their mind, but you have, if you had said 10 years ago you're going to do this camp in northern Israel, you're going to bring kids in from all over the place, I, I, it would have been hard to sell that idea. Uh, it's... It's something I personally ascribe to that anytime someone says, oh, it's, you can't, why not? You know, why is that? I mean, you, you see these tautological reasons of you can't do it because it hasn't been done before or you can't do it because you can't do it. You know, like, you don't know that. So try it and truly amazing things can happen as has been the case with Ultimate Peace. There's a ton more you can read about and learn about. Um, uh, ultimatejosh.com, if you just go there, I blogged extensively about the entire trip, photos and video. Ultimate Peace, if you, if you Google that, you will find both the blog and uh, their website. There's a ton of information out there, but if you start at ultimatejosh.com, you'll find everything. But at this point, I just wanted to open it up to questions. And we'll get a change in lights, too, I think. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yes? I know nothing about the history, but I'm fascinated by the opponents mm -hmm. are constantly talking to one another. Yeah. Um, so the way Ultimate works is if you watched it, it, it takes place on a field almost identical to a football field, but with slightly deeper end zones. You score one point by catching it in the end zone. And play starts just like in a football game. You th one team throws to the other team. Uh, and play never stops until a goal is scored or there needs to be a conversation about a call. So what that means is a point can last 10 seconds. It could last 10 minutes. Um, if I throw to you and you're on my team and you catch it, you have to stop as quickly as you're able. You can't run with the disc. But you can throw in any direction at any time. So in a way, it lo the movement looks a lot like lacrosse. So you'll see an attack towards the end zone, but it might not go straight. It might go from side, side to side. And then if I throw to you and something else happens, if, if someone in, on the other team intercepts it or someone on the other team hits it down, the other team immediately gains possession. So there's no stoppage. But if I try to throw the disc and someone, for example, hits my arm before I throw, throw the disc, I call a foul. There's certain things that happen if the person agrees, they, they say no contest. If they don't agree, they say contest. And a different, thing, a different outcome will happen if each, each of those cases happens. The ultimate peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what language are they communicating? Ah, that's a good question. Um, a whole lot of the time it's English, and a whole lot of the time you don't need words to figure out what's going on. Does that mean it's always perfect at the beginning? No. But what it means is you actually have two people trying to figure out how to communicate who maybe, like, phys really just communicate on a basic level using a common language they know about the sport to either, sometimes it's by motion, sometimes someone will come in to translate. English is the common language usually. Uh, in international competitions, it's usually used. Um, but it's, uh, it's used as that first face-to-face -face interaction of sorts where there's no pressure of anything else other than resolving what's going on on the field at the time. So it's a, it's a compartmentalization of potentially what could go on way outside of the field. The other thing yeah. I, I didn't, um, Maybe I missed it. Mm -hmm. Age, age level. Oh no, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. The age right now it's about 12 slash 13 all the way up to 18, 19. So it's a pretty big range right now. Mostly 14, 15 and older, but some younger kids have come to the program. Okay, but that's about the age. ultimate piece. That's the camp. Yeah. It mm -hmm. encompasses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You also have to realize there's a gap after that. That's important to realize. You turn 18 in Israel, you've got compulsory military service. So while most, uh, most international competitions, for example, are U19, uh, all the Israeli teams have 18 and under, uh, sorry, 17 and under, because you turn 18 or 19 and you're, you're in the service. Um, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Yeah? 
educators and peacemakers sometimes come under attack from fanatics. Has that begun yet? In I, you know, I had this great perspective of being a coach there and also seeing directly into the organizational structure, kind of being in some of the rooms with the administrators who I knew very well, who I was glad to have them do what they were doing because I really wanted to focus on the teaching aspect of it. I was never in a position other than that first one I told you about where that young girl was talking about uh, her local principal saying we're going to shut this down because it has to do with uh, uh, Perez for Peace and ultimate peace, you know, it's, it's a normalization campaign. It, it doesn't mean it, you know, it's, it's just there to get pictures. There haven't been, as far as I know, and in my experience, any direct uh, threats made, um, but I'm not aware of all the communication that comes in. Um, what's, what the, the strength of security, I think, has a lot to do with very, very specifically being about the sport and nothing else. One of the challenges that we have to answer, though, is people ask, where does the money come from? You know, you know even if you say what you do and you, you do what you say you do, if the money all comes from one place that is entrusted, then there's immediate distrust. The answer that Ultimate Peace can give is the majority of funds come from small donations in the United States and abroad. And some does come from the Israeli government. Some does, but not, not the majority. And the, I found that uh, having an American passport was actually a, a really strong thing to have as kind of a neutral, relatively trusted third party. It allowed me to get into the West Bank. Uh, most Israelis can't go. If you have a, if you're basically, essentially if you're a Jewish Israeli, you can't go into the West Bank. Um, but I could fly in from Vermont and go from Jerusalem 100 yards across the wall to visit Hamuda. But there was no way Hamuda could just come into Jerusalem and meet me for coffee. But so far, no. That being said, I'm not in a position to know all of the different avenues for communication. I mean, in the first year, Al Jazeera did a story on Ultimate Peace, and I know one of the plans is to potentially try to do something similar in an Arab country. Maybe try to run an Ultimate Peace Forum in Amman. You know, that was a different, different level of complexity. In the back. Go ahead. Why Israel? Why the Middle East? The original people that were involved were, uh, had direct ties to Israel, either lived there or were Jewish Americans. And then also the, 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 the geography made it possible to do what they would like to do, which was to bring disparate populations together. There are other places in the world where you have uh, populations that are in conflict, that are much further apart either separated by oceans or time zones. There are some that are closer, but there isn't anything closer than, or at least in my knowledge, than literally right on top of each other in a country where even inside the, what I, what I would personally call like non-contested Israel, like uh, is, is so separated. So I think that the geography and then also the personal connections of the people that wanted to start it. Um, and also while there are many other conflicts, uh, uh, the Israel-Palestine is certainly one that comes to the forefront when it comes to the, I guess, consciousness. You know, global consciousness is another reason, but definitely the people that were involved originally had connections to the region. Yeah. Will you be returning? I hope so. Uh, it's it's a it's a major uh, time commitment in the summer, and it's nice that I have a teacher's life that allows me to change modes in the summer. I, I hope to. I would I would love to go back. I mean, uh, you know, it's something where you have this very intense experience in one place and then you're outside of it, so it's sometimes hard to remember what it's like, but then talking about it or explaining or seeing pictures, I'm immediately drawn back to, like, oh my God, I would love to. You know, then again, we'll see how life <laughs> translates into being able to go back. Uh, Charlie, and then the back. Uh, what's Ultimate doing now for the rest of the year? Uh, what's Ultimate Peace doing now for the rest of the year? Oh, in the region, yeah. They, so they have the local, pe uh, local coaches who live year-round in Israel. They visit uh, those villages pretty regularly to run practices. Um, I know that they've had, or they will have soon, a kind of a regional tournament. Um, and then the big thing that's happening really soon is that they're bringing a team of Ultimate Peace teenagers to the United States. Uh, they get here 
like in the either late April or early May, and they're doing a kind of a cross country tour. They're going into different Boston. I know it's Boston and Seattle. I don't know where they're going in between, but they're playing games and uh, uh, talking about ultimate peace, uh, fundraising, participating in youth tournaments. And I think I think it's fifteen or sixteen kids. I think so, and I'm. Um, Almost positive it's a co-ed team, I'm pretty sure, um, but I'm not 100% positive, but they, that happens soon. And that, that's, that's a new thing for Ultimate Peace to be able to do that. In the back, was it? Go ahead. Two questions, sure. if I may. Um, am I correct in assuming that when you have, say you have a brown team and a, and a blue team, yeah. that it's, each team is mixed? Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually I brought that up. The teams are very uh, specifically created to be as mixed as possible. So they look at the numbers from each community and then each different type of population and then mix everybody up accordingly. It's not everybody from one village is together. They, make, they very carefully make sure that that doesn't happen. It'll happen where one or two kids from the same village will be together in a team, but it'll be five or six different villages all playing together on one of the, the teams which are just created by color of their jersey. And then you'll... My other question yeah. is, 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 is Israel continuing to build the wall? Uh, I do not know. I don't know. I know things have gotten pretty, how shall I say, uh, busy in the past couple months, uh, but I don't know how much of the wall is being constructed. I know that most of what is being talked about right now are settlements in some of the regions between East and West Jerusalem, uh, but I don't know physically about the wall itself. It's, it's big. It's very big. I went through a different, kind of a non-standard time, so my crossings were themselves kind of non-standard. I went through during times when there was really no one, literally no one else going across. I w drove across mostly and once walked across, so I got an idea of what it's like. I mean, when walking, there's a whole big S of outside enclosure, and then you're inside, and then there's uh, walkways at you know 15 feet with people walking on up above, and then you then you get through. And it was you know they saw the American passports and they're like, oh, give me a stamp or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But it, I was there at non-standard times. I can imagine, I, you know, it gets very busy at times. Will yeah. the Ultimate Peace Team come here for your Ultimate <laughs> <laughs> That would be really neat. No, they, 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 my weekend, either that exact weekend or the weekend after, they'll be in Seattle at what is the West, the West Coast's largest uh, Ultimate Program. What's, you know, the, the Seattle tournament also has the added benefit of having the Seattle City right there too. Uh, they get a little bit more exposure when they say, oh, I gotta work on it. I gotta work on it. I'll see what I can do next time. Come up to the Northeast Kingdom and, uh, you know. Yeah? So th this, is, this game then, mm -hmm. it's, it's an Eastern game? Uh, it's from the Eastern uh, United States. Started well, it started, well, the, it was first really, re the organized play was at all levels first in the East Coast, uh, 68 Maple. Uh, well, I, I can't, I'm from California. Yeah. And, and I would have just said it started on a beach in California. Well, no, no. So, what, the, so the, the brief history of Ultimate, the name Frisbee comes from the Frisbee Pie Tin Company, which made, Waymo. well, Waymo then bought it. Yeah. But Frisbee Pie Tins, you'll, you can find old ones, antique ones, they're worth a lot of money, keep them. Um, and then they were first thrown by uh, Yale students, apparently, as, as projectiles. But then, uh, after Jared Koss taught the game to some of his campers, they brought it back to Maplewood, New Jersey, where they started kind of as a, as a joke, but semi-seriously, the varsity ultimate team. I would have lost money, but that started. <laughs> <laughs> no, then the first college games, Tufts, Rutgers, UMass. Uh, first college championships, well, uh, 84. It's nice to know that California wasn't first. <laughs> no, and it, it's, uh, you got a, lot of, got a lot of good beach ultimate, but there are a lot of good California teams, that's for certain. Yes, and then there, yeah. Go ahead. $300,000 for 200 participants is less than summer camps around here. How do they run that level of expenditure? That's a very good question. Um, I think that there's two things that help. One, uh, many of the things that we pay for here are cheaper in Israel, as far as I understand it. Um, I also think that uh, it's, it's the, the budget is run really, really close to all of the money they have. It's, it's, it, it's not a, you know, a penny goes unutilized, I guess is the way to say it. The other answer to the question is, I don't know <laughs> the specific details of when I got there and I got to see this inner working of this huge, like with this 200 campers and 50 coaches, it was amazing to me what was kind of, what was created organically. 
You know, co the coaches aren't paid to be there, for example. The coaches have to raise money in order to go. So you have a certain amount of money that you get to, and then if you raise more than that, you will get your plane, you know, your ticket covered as long as you raise enough to cover your plane ticket. So for example, one way is that the people who work there, it's all volunteer, even more than that, they raise money beyond what, they, what it costs to get people there. So that's, that's one way. It's interesting you brought that up too, is that if, uh, in terms of other locations, one of the conversations I had with Hamuda's father was, he said, you know what? You know, if you wanted to do this you know, next summer in Bethlehem, we could do it at one-tenth the cost. So it's one, one idea he had was, you know, maybe you do it with just a local population inside Bethlehem and a few of the communities, but you could have 200 kids and then use that like pre-camp as a, a, one of the incentives there is to come into Akko. Um, you know, and maybe you'd get some Israeli students coming, maybe, you know, it, they're, they're, you know not, again, nothing is impossible, but for him, he, when he budgeted it out, he's like, you know, you could do it for $20,000. Uh, in the back, and then Charlie. Um, so do you have a designated field here at the academy? Oh, for, for ultimate? Yeah. Well, right now, so we, when we, during the season, we practice on campus. Uh, we'll practice on what I think you know of as the soccer field, is what we'll be mm -hmm. practicing on. Uh, right now, we're outside on the, the parking lot at Three Fields, which we really, really like, because it gets us outside on day one of spring in Vermont. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but then when we run our home tournament, um, I take all of them everywhere. So our home tournament will be all of the fields at the academy, the available, available ones at Linden Institute. We take over the fairgrounds, Linden Town School. We're probably going to have to go out into Danville this year and probably Barnett. How many teams? This year I'm looking at 60 to 65 teams. We have 22 girls teams coming in and 38 to 45 boys teams. Right now we're limited by field space. I wish the state was flatter. <laughs> you crossed the border, I went up to Montreal, and it's, it's flattened out, and I look at it, and all I think was, man, I could put a hundred teams right there. <laughs> Charlie. Yes, is Ultimate uh, still going on the West Bank? Yeah, um, the, as far as I know, the Beit Horror program is still going. Uh, Bethlehem community is, is very popular, I mean, that's where Hamoud is from, and more and more of his family members. I know. Ramallah was one community where they had not gotten to yet, but I know it's on the on the list of potential places. Um, that's one place I want I would I did not make it to last summer. That if I go back, I would like to go to uh, go to Ramallah. You know, there's a Quaker school there that I'd like to see, uh, and a few other places. I mean, there's a lot of the northern West Bank. There's, there's a lot of it's three million people, right there. Do you have as many girls as boys? In ah, so as far as I remember, there it wasn't 50-50 but it was closer to 60, 40 boys to girls. Um, I had a great, so I coached the boys the first week, more advanced boys. I had a great time coaching the girls team, it was great. Uh, uh, two things really worked in my favor. Uh, one was that uh, I was always gonna stand out no matter what team I was coaching, I was always gonna be different and wacky and strange, so it, it didn't matter, you know, I was gonna be even more different and wacky and strange working with the teenage girls from Israel and the West Bank. And then the other thing that worked in my favor was that it's on, on in all in many I, I, I struggle sometimes for the words to correctly quantify the region, but it's much more common for men to be in positions of teaching authority. So the girls were actually much more comfortable, at least from my perspective, being led by a man in a way. It also again, but it was that it, it, part of that was you know me being comfortable as a teacher but then really enjoying the fact that I, it didn't matter what I did, I was gonna be weird no matter what I did. And I, I, I tried to be weird. I mean, I stumbled onto things that, you know, uh, 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 the girls were goofing around and they were putting on nail polish. And like, can we put some on you? I was like, sure, you know, right? And you know what I found? There are certain things that are gonna be harder to solve than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It was much harder for my male campers to understand or just totally cope with me wearing nail polish <laughs> than anything else that happened the entire time I was there. <laughs> it was fun. They didn't know what to do. They honestly had no idea how to react. At all. It was really strange. What? They weren't sure what you were all about. Oh, sure. They said, no, there was no, it was, it was fascinating to me. And then I was like, okay, this is a different level of conversation that we're going to get to here. Yeah, 
politically or geographically or both? Well, just, you know, <laughs> did you notice any difference? Well, the, the challenge I have in comparing it is that I had a very different type of experience in both in, in, in Jordan. I was never in a population center. I never went to Amman or a city. You know, I was in the gateway to Petra, uh, which is very touristy. You know, I was in a, like a tourist hotel for a couple nights and traveling by taxi. Um, it's hard to say because I, I would really need to go to a, a, a place where I'd actually inter, inter, interact with regular people. And I never had that chance, except in the Bedouin community was, I guess, regular people. But that's still a, 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 a tourist going through the desert in a Jeep. It was not quite the same. Um, uh, I would like to see him on. Uh, I mean, one of my personal goals, though, is like to see the crossing between Jordan and the West Bank. Um, I think it's the King's Crossing, I think is what it's called. Um, it is not highly traveled at all by non-West Bank, uh, not, if you're from outside the West Bank or Jordan. It's primarily only people in Palestine and Jordan. It's, <laughs> one thing I learned, another thing I learned was that living in the West Bank, it is very, very difficult to travel, uh, more so than I thought. Um, uh, one of the girls that I met when I was in the West Bank was talking about, and keep in mind she's from a well-to-do family, she had a back problem and she needed to get surgery, so she went to Amman to do that. And coming back into the West Bank from Amman, uh, you have to realize the border is still, it's, it's run by Israel. Uh, coming back into the West Bank was extremely difficult. She had to prove she had surgery and then went to, all these different things. So I heard it over and over and living in the area was very much like living just in a big prison. Uh, you know, you, there's, it's, there are, again, it's incredibly complicated and there are great reasons on every side for everything. Um, it's just so complex, it's very hard to come to any, it's impossible to judge. I mean, I'm this guy from Leverett, Massachusetts, you know, what, what, what do I know? Yeah. You know, what do I know? Yeah. Any other? I just read, yeah. you know, when Israel first became a, a country, mm -hmm. that the um, Jewish population spoke Arabic, and mm -hmm. now they rarely Well, well yeah, I mean, I do know that the, 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 the spoken Hebrew is a um, totally modern, Remodernization. I mean, one of the greatest triumphs of Israel was reintroducing Hebrew as a spoken language in the last uh, 75, 85 years. I wonder if it affected the way that they... Oh, because actually communicating. communicating. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I, probably. Probably. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming.